the way in which the industrialists finance themselves is kind of ad hoc, if you like. It's there are is the creation of local banks. That's one thing, um, which don't have a great deal to do with London till well into the nineteenth century. But you also get money raised literally through um, profits. Most of the money that goes into investment in industry, in Lancashire, for instance, is actually ploughed back profit of various kinds. And, but also you get very informal arrangements whereby, for instance, solicitors who know everybody because of legal transactions and family kind and so forth are often become depositories for money, which are then handed out to other people, you know, to help them to, with their businesses and so forth. And they become, it's an informal network that works extremely well sometimes. Now, the, the city and the industry are not cut off from each other completely. I mean, quite, well, a, a very good deal of the export trade that comes out of Lancashire and Yorkshire and the, and the West Midlands is actually using London money uh, for, for trade finance. I mean, that, that's uh, well established and carries on. Uh, but th- when it comes to financing business, that's where there's a divorce, you know, the, and it's a divorce which is actually accentuated by mutual suspicion, and the mutual suspicion, of course, comes from separation. I mean, geography, it doesn't seem far, you know, to Sheffield these days, only two hours on the train, but uh, in those days it was an awful long way, and the people didn't know each other, and all kinds of rumours could float around about, you know, being ripped off and so forth. So you find that industry doesn't want to go down to London. Uh, ditto with London, when you've got uh, an assumption quite often that if you're a gentleman, uh, industry isn't something you want anything to do with because it means work and labour. Uh, and that's not culturally very nice. You know? um, so you have all these uh, cultural inhibitions, really, as well, which are built into the relationship. So it's fairly limited. The first thing to say about it is it's a very slow process. Uh, You can see the beginnings of it uh, round about the middle of the century um, because from then onwards there is a tendency for the landed aristocracy's central interest, which is agriculture, to decline pretty rapidly. And it's subject to huge amounts of foreign competition, arable agriculture, and a great many incomes suffer very badly as a result. And one of the ways in which the aristocracy actually react to this is by investing more of their money in city activities of various kinds, in in city investments, which I'll I'll come back to in a moment. But the city itself, its growth of its impact on consciousness, if you like, is a very slow process. I put it this way, in, in 1815, if you talk to somebody about what was the central feature of the British economy, what was its main hub of activity that everything else revolved around, You'd say agriculture. And that's where the aristocracy would think automatically to be the case. Now, this is being challenged in the 1820s, 1830s by people in London who are actually saying, no, this is not the case. And what they're thinking at that time is that manufacturing is going to become the kind of central economic activity. And the key reason being that agriculture won't be able to provide enough food Uh, for the population, which is growing very rapidly, and therefore it'll lose its central function because there'll have to be a huge amount of import of food, and to pay for that, we have to manufacture a great deal. So we've got to let the manufacturing sector grow and grow and grow. So one argument is the manufacturing is going to become the hub of the economy. But what happens in practice as the century progresses, is that manufacturing does grow hugely, of course. I mean, it's about 40% of the national income is is in agriculture in about 1910 or so. But what also grows extremely rapidly is this service sector. 
particularly strongly in the south of England, the southeast of England, but also in the north. I mean, there's a very big growth of service sector there as well. And one of the key parts of this is the growth of the city, which grows enormously between about 1840 and 1914 in terms of personnel and activity and income generated and so forth. And it's, it's that period up until 1914, I'd say, where you begin to get what I really call a kind of equality between the old governing elites and the city in terms of economic influence, if you like. And industry still has a lot of economic inf in, uh, influence, of course, but its problem is it's a long way off and it also is not very united. I mean, Liverpool hates Manchester and Manchester doesn't know anything about Sheffield. <laughs> so they're fragmented and insofar as it's very difficult for them to actually come together to make a big issue. When they do it, they can be extremely powerful, as with um, the repeal of the Corn Laws in the 1840s, the coming of free trade. That was a very concerted effort in which the North had a very big influence and Scotland as well. But it, that's a rarity. Whereas the city is much more integrated with aristocracy because it's in London, it's close to government, the Bank of England is a kind of connection uh, between the two. And there's the beginnings by 1914 of intermarriage between the really wealthy boys in the city and the aristocracy, a good example, for instance, will be Lord Rosebery, who was uh, prime minister in the 1890s, actually married a daughter of the Rothschilds, Hannah Rothschild. And that's becoming common, you know, by 1900 or so. And we have argued for a very long time, um, and it's been disputed, but... Um, what we're saying effectively is that insofar as in 1815 people thought agriculture was the hub of the economy and then there was an assumption that the manufacturing sector would take over from it, what actually happens is increasingly elites, political elites, come to see the whole of the kind of London service sector of which the city is the centre as being the key to the economy. So that people in the Treasury in the 1920s are actually saying things like industry uh, is big and it's important, but what really drives this economy is commerce and finance. And industry depends upon them. So you've got to think of it that way. And of course, once you start thinking like that, what you're really doing is suggesting uh, that the city ought to be taken seriously when you come to think about economic policy and an assumption grows up which I could put it this way if an industrial MP even a well-known man stands up and talks about industry and in wherever he comes from he's regarded as a very respectable figure but he's seen to be talking about his interests or the interests of his locality whereas when the MP for the city of London gets on his pins in the House of Commons, he's often assumed to be, as it were, reflecting the national interest in these matters. He's speaking for the nation. Now, when you get to that stage, what it means is that Chancellor of the Exchequer, who very rarely have anything to do with industry, I mean, if you look at English political elites, they very rarely have an industrial origin. They will tend to see the city as being someone you really listen to. Whereas industrialists are people you have to deal with when they make enough noise. It's that kind of distinction that you make, really. Yeah, I think you could make a case for that. We tried to make a case for that. The problem with free trade is that although the industrialists are really behind it on the whole, and the city is very uncertain in the 1840s, not quite clear what it wants, it's divided. 
on the issue because it's got so many old colonial interests uh, which will suffer if you have free trade. But as it develops, what happens to industry is it becomes increasingly under competition from Germany, Belgium, France and the rest of it. And free trade is seen by many of them as a very one-sided thing because we are free trade. We let they, them into our markets, but uh, they protect themselves uh, against us. Now, the city is a different matter. As I say, the city is very hesitant initially in the 1840s, but it grows to love it much more over time. And that's because of a change, if you like, in the structure of the city's business that takes place, which no one could really have predicted in the 1840s. You remember I said beforehand that one of the big things that the city's business was about was the national debt. Now, after 1815, you're into an age of very parsimonious governments. And the national debt not only doesn't increase, it actually falls steadily. And a lot of business, therefore, is not happening as far as the city is concerned. And the question is, where do these savings go that are being generated and people want to find outlets for? Now, for quite a while, the railways fill that gap from about the 1830s to the 1870s because a huge amount of investment, much of it pioneered through the city, which actually goes into railways. But by 1870, that's more or less over. I mean, it's just not big enough anymore to matter. So in lieu of all this, what the city does is actually shift itself into overseas investment. And this is when it really begins to take off, is from the 1850s onwards. And what they're investing in is, in many ways, the kind of things they were investing in in Britain beforehand, which is governments, government debt, but also into railways, uh, infrastructural investments like ports and so forth. And they've got a huge empire, of course, in which to do this, They've got the Indian market. They've got all these new white colonies like Australia and Canada, which are beginning to grow rapidly and which want railway extensions, you know, to widen the agricultural frontier overseas. But besides that, the city develops very much in the late 19th century as a cosmopolitan financial centre. And if you look at places, for instance, where it has very large amounts of money, You've got Argentina, for instance, by 1913, which is a, a Spanish-speaking, white, settled country, but which owes as much money to us in 1913 as Australia does. The United States is a big borrower. Egypt is a big borrower because it's one very early developing country trying to get out of, you know, traditional agricultural um, life doesn't succeed, of course, but um, nonetheless, it borrows an awful lot of money to try to do this. So what you have there is a very cosmopolitan city. And by 1913, it's not just got this huge trade connection and lending money for trade and insurance and shipping services, all of which are connected together, but it's got this, this vast amount of money which has actually been sent abroad. Their estimates vary between 3 billion and 4 billion. Now, you'd have to multiply that by hundreds to make sense of it in modern terms, how much it would be worth if we had it now. And you can get some idea of its importance from the fact that the returns, the interest and the dividends on uh, money invested abroad, most of which is coming back through the city in various ways, is actually... Um, about 8% of the national income in 1913. And that's going to a, a relatively small number of wealthy people, of course. And in the process, of course, it becomes extraordinarily wealthy. Um, the big merchant bankers are now rivals of the aristocracy in terms of wealth. And far ahead of most industrialists in this respect because competition in the industry is much sharper. And as you can imagine, in those circumstances, free trade seems pretty good from the city's point of view. There are dissenting voices, 
uh, there are one or two people who are not happy with it uh, or are willing to see that it might bring problems for Britain. But on the whole, you know, it's very difficult uh, to move the city on free trade. Uh, most of the kind of... If you think of Joseph Chamberlain, for instance, as the man who's actually uh, you know, trying to gather together all the anti-free trade interests in Britain around 1900 into some kind of big pressure group. Um, he's reliant f uh, very much on the West Midlands, on North, um, and it's not so much working men as middle-class industrialists who are his biggest supporters. You know. The aristocratic influence is still very strong uh, before 1914. It's only just beginning to break up politically. If you look at, for instance, the Conservative cabinet that, of the late 90s uh, to 1903 or 4, which is what um, Chamberlain was a member of, um, it was called the Hotel Cecil at one point because it was so many members of the Cecil family, which was the Lord Salisbury and all the grandees from Hatfield. And uh, uh, the, de the person who succeeded him was Balfour, who was his nephew. Um, so you can still see that the aristocracy are still accepted as the kind of governing class, you see what I mean? Um, it's only in... Just before the war, you begin to see people breaking through who are not. But the city itself is not very politically active at the top. In the 20s and 30s, insofar as non-aristocrats begin to really break through into government, it tends to be industrialists, funnily enough, people like Stanley Baldwin. Uh, but they are imbued with what I would call, or most of them, on the conservative side with public school culture you see because it's the public schools which actually bring together the elite the wealthy elite and a great many industrialists are going to public schools as well as uh, the children of uh, the city and the aristocracy you know by by 1914 and it's only, I'd say the aristocracy had only begun to really get shifted away from top-class politics in the 30s, really. That's when you can say, you know, there has been a sea change taking place. But if you think of the 1950s, for instance, what you've got then uh, in charge, say with the Conservatives, during, say, Macmillan's time in the 50s, is a lot of gentlemanly capitalists, effectively. They often come from professional backgrounds, but then the southern professional class is very much wedged into the, the gentlemanly class. Um, it serves the elite. And also, if you look, for instance, at... Um, say you look at all the people who govern the empire between the wars, or right into the 50s, they, there's some aristocrats left, but many of them are sons of... The, the professional classes, uh, an amazing number of them are actually uh, are actually sons of vicars uh, from the Church of England. So you have very firmly a gentlemanly class, you know, in place. If you like. Let me think. Just take the gold standard, for instance, as an example. The return to the gold standard in 1925. We needn't worry ourselves about why we were on the gold standard at all, but it was regarded as a key political matter, going back to gold. Now, when Norman, who was the governor of the Bank of England, made the final decision to do that in 1924, he was thinking about what governing elites wanted but he was thinking more than anything else about what the city wanted. And he was very worried that if there was not a return to the gold standard, then sterling, which was the big international currency, would actually lose its status and its prestige and that slowly but surely the Americans would become the dominant force in, in the world. 
and the city would lose out. And because the city would lose out, the assumption was the rest of the nation would lose out. Uh, there's no attempt to sort of be conspiratorial on behalf of the city. The assumption is that the, if we get it right for the city, then we'll get it right for everybody else. Uh, and it's that kind of thinking. And it's thinking which I, you know, you can see running on and on and on into the, in the 20th century. Very difficult to, to break it. And what's more, industrialists, although they often grumble about it, usually finish up accepting it. Because what they're presented with is this idea that whether we all have this orthodoxy or there might be some kind of chaos. Uh, and of course, chaos is you don't want. So, and since the, you don't understand the ins and outs of, inter, of finance and international finance, you tend to leave it alone. And uh, in those circumstances, the, the gentlemanly elite and the city type of ideas that they run with tend to win by default to a large extent. You're thinking of the Bering Crisis yes. of 1890. Yes, I think what happens in 1890 is when the bank are faced with the crisis, which is Revelstoke, who's the head of Bering's, coming in literally crying uh, and saying to the governor, look, we can't pay our debts. We've, we've just over-invested. We haven't got any cash and we've got money due. What do we do? And Lidderdale, who was the governor of the Bank of England, just calls in all the other merchant bankers. This is without telling the public at all. This is entirely private. And he also goes to the government. And the government said to him, well, sort it out. You, know, you can do it. Uh, we won't intervene unless we have to. But there was a kind of assumption that they would if they had to. So what Lidderdale does, he calls in the Rothschilds, he calls in all the other big boys in the city in the merchant banking fraternity, and he says, look, this is the problem. Now, what we need to do is when we announce the fact that bearings are illiquid, what we also need to do is to say, well, we've got the cash to back them up. As therefore, the crisis will be mitigated and London's reputation will be saved. Now, they demur a bit at first. They don't like the idea of, uh, you know, helping a rival. But they soon come to see that this is the case. Uh, it's necessary for their own sakes. You know, they, it's self-preservation. So they do it. And after that, Lidderdale then calls the clearing banks in, who are much bigger in terms of, you know, capital and so forth, but uh, not central uh, to the city group. Uh, you know, the, the Bank of England's kind of, cohort of people that it talks to and he says to them you've got to lend some money as well <laughs> uh, to to make this fund work and they don't like it at all so he says his response is to say well you may not like it but um you know we could always withdraw your account uh, with the bank now the prestige involved in that you know, loss of prestige could be quite great. Uh, so they say, OK, we'll hand over the cash as well. And then Lidderdale can actually say to the financial community and to the world, you know, we've got a problem, but we have got the solution at the same time. But you can see how it's done through a network. And it works because it's an informal set of arrangements. And the government stays away while, as it were, letting it happen. And insofar as the clearing banks are brought into this, it's simply as an extra, because they're necessary to raise the amount of money, because Bearings owed an awful lot in 1890. Well, if you think about it, um, 
the reason why the city is keen to invest in these places or, or the savers in the city are keen on it is because these are capitalist countries and they, as it were, inherit a kind of structure of law and of order from Europe, which they take over. So they're secure places. So the chances of you getting your money back and a decent return on your money are much better than they are, for instance, in places like China, where you simply don't have the law and order to rely on. And they're also better than some parts of the empire for the simple reason that uh, these are, uh, are countries where are more productive. You know, they're, they're going to bring bigger returns in a shorter time. And Africa, in many ways, is, from the city's point of view, is not a fearfully important place. What gives it a glamour is South Africa because of the gold discoveries and all the investment that's necessary from the 1890s onwards in gold uh, to actually produce it. It is a heavy capital investment industry from, from the late 90s onwards. And the city, of course, is very involved in that. And, of course, that is all famous because of Cecil Rhodes, you know, Rhodes' political ambitions of using all the money you get from gold in order to sort of create a huge African empire for the British. That is a glamorous thing. And it's... But if you take away South Africa and Egypt, the amount of money invested in the rest of Africa is not large. And the trade of the rest of Africa is not great. It's growing by 1913. The places where the city is really doing well and where it's invested the bulk of its money is in places which are kind of white settled periphery. They're the, the predominant places. Because as I say, they're safe as, as much as anything else. And also because they've got rapidly growing populations so that the demand for money is, is very high. And also the city does have a kind of imaginative bias in favour of um, uh, newly settled countries because they're described constantly as young countries, um, which means that they're really just getting going and therefore the returns that you're going to get on investments are going to be great. You know, We're an old country, they're a new one. And they're, they, there's a lot of optimism about them, which actually encourages... Uh, investment sometimes encourages disaster as well but at the same time the overriding feeling right into the well into the 20th century is that these are countries where you can get really good returns on your money well when you invest in markets which prove insecure say like egypt uh 1860s it's doing well 1870s it's suddenly heading for disaster and bankruptcy. When you get that kind of uncertainty, you can't rely on the locals providing, or you assume you can't rely on the locals providing you uh, with cast iron guarantees that they'll pay you back. And often what happens then is you slide into increasing control, trying to run their financial systems for them and quite often what that then kicks over into, slowly but surely, is actual political control. And that's certainly the case in Egypt. The run-up to the occupation of 1882 starts in a huge financial crisis in the mid-70s, which then escalates into an increasing uh, attempt, first by the British and the French together, uh, to actually bring some order to the business. And then the French fall out for various reasons and the British are left, as it were, to decide what to do. And they could have withdrawn, yes, but they'd have, it would have been extremely risky from their investments point of view. And what they tend to do in those circumstances is, is go in to try to create order. Uh, and they intend to stay for six months or something and then finish up staying until 1952 or whatever it was. Um, and it... it Egypt, although it's never, I don't think, ever uh, under British sovereignty directly, is nonetheless part of the British Empire for about 70 years as a result. Now, in white countries, you don't have that problem. You know that sooner or later, debts will get paid. 
There may be horrible crises like the big depression of the 1890s, which wrecked the Argentinian economy and the, and the Australian economy. But they're much more geared to capitalism and markets. And they understand perfectly well that to get back to growth and to get back to the kind of life they want, they're going to have to come to settlement over their debts. Now, in Egypt, of course, you're in a different world, a pre-industrial world, a pre-capitalist world to a large extent. And it doesn't work like that. And therefore, quite often, in order to make it work, you have to intervene. But you don't have to do that. Like, you never consider doing it in Australia or or Canada, or places like that. You know, they're white, for God's sake. You know, <laughs> it's that kind of thinking. Well, yes, yeah. I mean, uh, there is an assumption that as the senior world financial power, we are the people who know how to run economies. And when you're faced with what is called all the time uncivilised communities like Egypt, which means that they're pre-capitalist, basically, and they have different kinds of ideas about what matters and what doesn't, um, the, the argument then is, you know, we have to step in because we know and they don't. And this is an assumption that runs through not just finance, of course, it runs through the whole of the British attitude towards the empire, to the dependent empire. They don't think like that about the white empire. They see them as growing children who one day will be part of some kind of big British family, um, like Canada or Australia. But when it comes to Egypt and places like that, then these countries are going to be children for a very long time indeed. You know, they're talking hundreds of years, you know, at the time. And uh, I mean, the assumption is we'll be in India for God knows how long, you know. But it's certainly, we, the idea, if you'd told some uh, leading governor general in 1910 that we'd have left India by 1948, he would have found it probably inconceivable. Um, the only way he could have thought that might happen is if we'd lost it to another European power in war or something, you know. But he, the idea that they would become independent would have probably been quite beyond him. You know, there's an all-party parliamentary group on character and resilience that lists sort of grit, self-control, optimism and zest as the yeah, characters yeah. that will sort of drive Britain forward. And actually... Uh, part of the APDG's project is getting uh, teachers from Eton to teach grit and zest to um, state schools. Which yeah. Is sort of a <laughs> what, what interests me about that particularly is that if you look at the way character is described before 1914, then it takes all that into account but he also adds the, the strong public school virtues of the time, which is come from the aristocracy, which is honour and service to the public. And the governors general see themselves as doing this. This is what they're doing. They're, they're pursuing Britain's interests abroad. And as far as they're concerned, you know, sacrificing a certain amount in so doing, either by living in incon incongenial climates or... Uh, not getting anything like the kind of rewards in financial terms that they could have got if they'd done other things. Um, that second set of uh, qualities has disappeared from the latest character idea, I notice. Mm. And um, I think this has got a lot to do with the... What it tells you is that that particular class of people have disappeared now in Britain. But it also tells you that the majority a very large number of public school entrants these days, in fact, are foreigners who, who cannot be taught old-fashioned English virtues of that kind. They can only be taught more kind of capitalist values um, because they're the only ones that make sense to them. <laughs>
Well, I think the, the point to make is that um, the Stirling area is something which emerges in the 20s and 30s. Uh, there's, there's no concept of it before 1914. Stirling is just a kind of, uh, you know, universal currency, really. Um, what happens between the wars is that the structure that existed before 1914, the whole city structure and its relationship with the world, if you like, in general, is maintained despite the First World War, despite the Depression of the 1930s. Um, it's still visibly the same in 1940 as it was, you know, as it, when it went into the war in 1914. But Sterling is hasn't got the same degree of power in the world between the wars as it had before it. And it's under competition from the dollar, uh, particularly. Now, the sterling area, what happens is that the dollar begins to invade quite a lot of markets that we'd say in Latin America and places like that. And there's a tendency for the sterling and the empire to become more closely linked to get you know to be more coterminous as it were um but also there are a number of countries quite tend to be smaller ones outside that in europe and elsewhere who are part of the sterling area now that survives as probably the biggest single sort of uh, currency group in the world and it gets a boost in the 1930s because the American Depression is so much greater than ours uh, that the dollar kind of fades for a while and the United States foreign investment sort of declines terribly in the 30s. And we begin to sort of... And sterling begins to look as though it's going to make a kind of recovery uh, to a kind of pre-1914 stand. Now, that period only lasts about five years. Uh, and by the 1937-38, the pressure of Germany and the pressure of Japan between them on the empire are so great that sterling is beginning to become very weak indeed. You know, people are very uncertain about using it. And you can see the dollar beginning to appear as the central currency. There's an agreement, a very obscure agreement made in 1936 called the Tripartite Agreement between the French, the British and the United States, which is about currencies. And which, if you read the small print, actually tells you that the other two currencies are actually, deter uh, are actually determined in the context of the first, which is the dollar. In other words, there's a beginning to be a recognition of the fact that the dollar is the key currency. From 1940 onwards, that's obvious. Our world is totally dependent upon the Americans. Well, wars, wars are bad for financial centres because financial centres depend upon freedom of markets, you know, and they disappear during the war. Everything comes under control. Now, they managed to survive the first one surprisingly well, actually. And one of the ways in which they survive was the fact the government borrowed such a huge amount during the war rather than raise taxes. And of course, all that, a lot of that's channeled through the city. Uh, so that's city business as well. But in many other ways, they were very restricted. In the Second World War, you finish up with, for instance, very large amounts of British foreign investments just being liquidated to pay for the cost of the war. And the Americans step in and lend us vast amounts of money on the Lend-Lease arrangements from 1941 onwards. And after the war, there is martial aid, which means the Americans have write off quite a lot of our debts, along with Europe's as well. But the dollar is the key currency. Everybody wants dollars. And our share of world trade has fallen a lot. Um, and also we're faced with decolonization. Suddenly India's off, 1948, with it, although there's an attempt to stop it um, by the late 50s, Africa is moving very rapidly in the same direction. By 1958, it's assumed that the empire will dissolve itself. 
the white empire is becoming increasingly distant from us, partly because um, it, America becomes a much more attractive proposition for borrowing money, for trade, and so forth. And one of the great turning points, of course, is the British uh, um, application to join Europe in the early 60s, which is a way of saying the old way of life doesn't work anymore. You know, we're not the great imperial power of the past. Now, the city, as the centrepiece of the Stirling area, its financial hub, of course, has had a tough time in the 40s and 50s while all this is happening. But the city, I, you have to admire the city because it's got this wonderful way of reinventing itself time and time again, and reusing the expertise it learned in empire uh, elsewhere. And what it tends to do from the 50s onwards, and this is the beginning of what we see now, is to reposition itself between the two huge uh, financial markets, New York and Japan, which is the great burgeoning market in the 60s. But they're mainly interested in domestic uh, stocks. What the city does, it positions itself in the middle to become, as it were, the centre for what you might call footloose capital. The stuff that doesn't want to stay in the United States or Japan or go into other conventional channels, but wants to find markets outside this. And the classic example of that in the late 50s is the rise of what was called the euro dollar market, uh, which basically is American dollars, which for various reasons, very complex reasons, often legal, uh, can't or won't stay in America and is looking for places to go elsewhere. And the city grabs that market and actually takes it, becomes the chief kind of market for this currency. And it builds on that. And as the international economy becomes much more sophisticated, as multinational companies become much more sophisticated and so forth, the city, as it were, abandons empire and sterling, leaves all that behind, and becomes increasingly this kind of market for international capital. And the senior place, and it's, of course, it's beautifully placed between New York and Tokyo in the time zone. So it, it can operate between them very effectively as well. And if you think of Big Bang in the, you know, 1986, Big Bang is part of that process of the city internationalising itself. And what it's doing in, in 1986 is actually um, clearing out a lot of its own kind of clutter from the past, the way it did business, it's the restrictions that they brought. It wants to free itself, open itself up as much as it can to world capital. And it does that with huge success. But in the process, what it does, of course, it becomes a centre for foreign capital. I mean, most of the big firms in London are now foreign. They're American or they're Swiss or whatever, you know, but they're... Some are British, but it's not, as it was in 1945, a British financial mar market. But it, of course, it's survived. It's more than survived. It's done extremely well. And that is a very good example of the way in which the city adapts itself, you know, and has been doing now for 300 years over time. Remarkable ability to do this. Well, there is still um, what you could call a gentlemanly elite in Britain. If you look at the current government, for instance, or if you looked at the coalition that preceded it, it was an extraordinarily public school job, and the current one is as well. And these people are the heirs of the traditional kind of upper classes of England and they're well connected into what's left of the aristocracy uh, and they've got loads of money uh, they've all got the public uh, school education uh, 
and so forth. So yes, there is a gentlemanly elite there. The problem is that 40 or 50 years ago, you could still say that that gentlemanly elite and the city elite merged into each other at various levels. It's not that clear now at all. In fact, the ship, if you like, the city is the ship. Well, if, if the gentlemen and the capitalists uh, are not in charge of the ship anymore, they don't own it, uh, they don't run it. It's run by foreign capital to a large extent. But on the other hand, its interests and the traditional interests of the city are often quite close. You know, they haven't changed that much over time. Um, it's just that you wonder how long the kind of Cameron-type Eton uh, will actually be able to sort of talk to them. Uh, you can't tell. It's very difficult to say at the present moment. But certainly, if you look at... I mean, I need, I must say myself, to actually go and have a really good look at the latest rich list to see what kind of complexities it's got and how they're changing over time. Because I haven't done that, to be honest. I've neglected to do that. So I'm not clear in my own mind at the present moment as to how things are shifting. And, but I think once Big Bang came in, and it was very deliberate, it was a choice that the city made, it wasn't something that it had to do, um, then I think the die was cast. And the gentlemanly elite would become increasingly separate from the city itself. But there are still enough linkages uh, for them to work together, I think, at the moment. But how things will work out, I really don't know. I think its competitiveness in the 19th century is so great that any market that it can enter, which is allowed to enter, or which it can force its way into, it's going to dominate. Because it's got no competitors in the 19th century. There's no other capital market uh, that's got anything like the same facilities or power that the city's got. I mean, just to take an example, I mean, the French market which is the nearest, really, is actually there's far too much government control uh, on Paris financial markets uh, and which directs capital, often in place, into places where the capitalists don't really want to go. Like huge amounts of money was invested in Russia, which was all lost in 1917. And all that was for political purposes. It was to cement the alliance between the French and the Russians against the Germans. Now, the, British, the city and government never have that kind of relationship. The city will not lend money to anybody because the government wants it to. It's much freer than that. I mean, the, the, for years, the British government, in various ways, uh, the Foreign Office particularly, tried to <laughs> uh, persuade the city to invest in various Chinese projects, but they were very, very careful not to because they didn't think they'd get their money back, basically. And... The fact is the city, because of its global connections, is far more aware of profit opportunities than many other financial centres are. Its networks are fantastic. I mean, if you're thinking about, you know, all the money that goes abroad at the moment from the city, a lot of it is because the city knows so much and because it's got so many contacts. Because it, it, there's every, anybody and everybody has got some kind of contact in the city. Uh, because of cities global uh, and because it's the big international market. You know. So in many ways, I mean, the, the, by about 1870, the city has actually distanced itself as an international financial market from, from the others. And the Wall Street doesn't function like that at the time. Wall Street is almost entirely engrossed in, as you'd imagine, in American development. And it's only really sort of from the 1920s onwards that Wall Street becomes a serious competitor in various overseas markets. It's, it's the usual mixture of things. Um, 
sometimes conquest actually creates situations in which the city can take advantage. But quite often, it's the trading connections which actually create the opportunities or at least create the instability that then leads to the, uh, the imperial power feeling that it has to join in um, and take over. And the two work together. You know, they inter- interconnect at various times. Um, I mean, in India, for instance, I mean, if you think of the British uh, conquest of Bengal, it derives almost entirely from Britain's original trading connection through the East India Company. And when, when the British sent out the East India Company to do this, it's got no intention of conquering Bengal. It's just that the, the power of the East India Company within Bengal became so great that it began to become involved in the politics of India and got involved in all kinds of inter-provincial fights uh, and had to build up an army in order to defend itself uh, and finished up by becoming a conqueror of India. And in fact, until 1858, when the, the, the Raj was instituted and when the Queen Victoria actually became Queen of India, um, the, the country was actually run by the East India Company, which is a trading company. Now, the East India Company, if you look at the directorate of the East India Company when it, in its trading heyday, say late 18th, early 19th century, then the connections with the city are enormous. I mean, huge amounts of this trade they're doing is coming through the city anyway, the financing of the trade, but also many of the investors have got to put their money in the city when they get there and so forth. There's huge interconnections between the two. And what the, the city is doing is actually there in that case, partly helping to conquer India indirectly because it's helping the East India Company to finance itself, but also then benefiting from the actual control of India through British governments because then later on the British government says, oh, you know, partly for trading but often for strategic reasons, we want to build railways in India. Well, we can't leave it to private enterprise because they won't get built. You know, it's too insecure a country. So we're going to have to give government guarantees on the money. Now, that money is comes through the city. Now, it would never come, of course, if Britain wasn't in India because it's the British government which makes the decisions. But when you get out to somewhere like Argentina, the actual growth of the city's influence there and growth of Britain's influence is, is a kind of spontaneous development which grows as much because the Argentinians want it as for any other reasons, because the Argentinians begin to see themselves as a white republic that wants to develop. And to do that, it needs huge amounts of capital. And the only way it's going to get huge amounts of capital is if it actually goes to Europe and says, look, we are a safe place for your money. And we've also got huge prospects. Uh, and you've got the burgeoning cattle industry and so forth. In, and the beginning, you know, what turns out to be the corned beef industry much later and the city's impressed and once it's impressed of course it will start to invest lots of hiccups you know depressions and god knows what but on the whole very profitable relationship but very much a two-way process they want it we're happy to give it but what happens to the argentinian economy in the process it borrows so much money that in fact it's rhythm and its shape, to a large extent, begins to become dictated by Britain's influence. So that it's, it almost loses its economic autonomy by the 1890s. It's so dependent on what's happening in Britain. And in fact, it becomes very much like a colony for a while. Um, it's... One of its leading historians, Harry Ferns, says it was the first dominion in some ways. Uh, and it wanted to have that kind of relationship with Britain as well. The, the relationship with Australia and Canada, uh, not Canada, Canada 
right from the start, Canada decides that it's going to stick with the dollar. And the reason for that is because of proximity. It's so close. Even then, Canada takes in huge amounts of British capital over the years, uh, mainly in railway building. I mean, Canada is a creation of British money. There's the political will to actually bring all the colonies together and to dominate the Canadian West and to stop it from falling into the hands of the Americans. That is, is true. But that political will would have come to nothing if the, the, uh, the city had not been willing to invest in all the great transcontinental railways, which were the key to bringing that country into any kind of economic unity. Uh, so that, that's a classic example of a mixture of politics and economics, really, in which the city is kind of a central feature. Um, it, Argentina cannot, uh, you know, become part of the British Empire because it's basically Spanish. You know, and wouldn't want to. It's got very strong Spanish cultural linkages. Um, Sterling, let me put it this way. If you think of what, what, what's Britain doing in the 19th century internationally, it's by far the biggest inter market for international trade in goods, imports, exports. Because it's free trade, it's also a huge warehouse because you can put goods into London or other ports in Britain without paying any kind of cost. There's no tariff on it. So you can leave it in London and then send it somewhere else. So there's a huge re-export trade as well that goes on in London, which is very profitable. All that has to be financed. Most of that is coming through the city in various ways. On top of that, you've got a whole set of services which have developed in the city over the years, like insurance, Lloyd's, for instance, which is a central part of the city. Um, you've got um, lawyers, because all these things of, you know, prospectuses have got to be written by lawyers and all the rest of it. Uh, you've got um, architects, because a lot of overseas projects involve building of various kinds. You've got engineers, railways, etc., etc. It's a whole collection of professional forces all connected with city, all in London, all easy of access and the rest of it. Now, if you add to that the fact that the city is sending enormous amounts of British money abroad, all that money has to be repaid in various ways, and interest on it, dividends, God knows what. Now, all these payments are in sterling. Now, and they're by far the biggest segment of international trade. But sterling is a wonderful thing to hold because it's absolutely secure. The Navy makes sure of that. It brings you in a bit of money if you hold it. If you're actually a holder of sterling, then you can put it in, in a bank or something and get an interest on it for a while, that kind of thing. So you don't want to hold gold, for instance, you know, gold sterile. So you hold sterling, which is just as secure. So sterling becomes an international money that people can use, and which rests ultimately on Britain's power, on the Navy, on its ability to enforce its rule, if you like. In the, in, the, in the empire and in, in the informal world. And once it's reached that level, it will get used quite frequently in circumstances where Britain itself is not directly involved. Uh, I remember a guy called Hartley Withers, who was a kind of famous uh, financial economist before 1914, giving this example of the tea trade between Japan and the United States which was conducted entirely in sterling and basically uh, all, you know, movements in British banks uh, or banking in ledgers in London and so forth. It was in sterling. And you, you did it because sterling was money and it was the best money. So sterling effectively is the key currency. It's, it's almost exactly the way in which people want dollars now because you know you can, if you hold them, you're safe you know you can always spend them when you want to, and so forth. It's confidence. 
there's confidence in Sterling, but what backs up that confidence is not just the military power, the naval power, but it's also this enormous confidence in the city's range, wealth and power in the world as an economic entity. Uh, so it is very much the key currency in the 19th century. And people will take sterling um, in payment for things which have got nothing to do <laughs> with the actual British economy itself because they know they can give it to somebody else in return for what they want. Uh, it's the perfect money in many ways in the 19th century. <laughs>